In October of 2011, in honor of the 125th anniversary of the Horace Mann School, the Alumni and Development Office introduced a series of webcasts by Horace Mann faculty and administrators on subjects of interest to alumni of all ages. Our goal was to provide our alumni community around the world with an opportunity to experience firsthand life at Horace Mann School today. Now in our second year, we're thrilled to present today's webcast, College Counseling at Horace Mann School, Changes in New Directions with Con Oxelson and Tony Miranda. Con Oxelson is now in his second year as Horace Mann School's Director of College Counseling. From 2003 to 2011, Mr. Oxelson served as Upper School Dean and Department Chair at Harvard Westlake School in North Hollywood, California, where he managed the college counseling program for 850 students. Prior to that, Khan worked in the admissions offices at the University of San Francisco, St. Mary's College of California, University of California, Santa Cruz, and as the Director of Multicultural Recruitment uh, Programming and Regional Director of Admissions at University of Pennsylvania. Mr. Oxelson graduated from the University of San Francisco, where he was a President Scholar and an NCAA Division II National Champion in Swimming. He earned his master's degree in education at Harvard's Graduate School of Education. With him this afternoon is Ms. Tony Miranda. Ms. Miranda joined our College Counseling Office in January of 2013 as an Associate Director of College Counseling. Ms. Miranda came to us from Columbia University where, for six years, she held two positions, Assistant Director for the Upward Bound College Readiness Program and Director of Community-Based Initiatives and Senior Assistant Director of Undergraduate Admissions. Before moving to New York, Ms. Miranda worked as an admissions officer at Brown University. She holds a master's degree in education from Harvard University and a bachelor's degree in art history from Duke University. Again, welcome to this year's first webcast. Khan, the mic is yours. Good afternoon. It's great to be here. Uh, it's been a wonderful transition for me from California to New York. And part of the reason it's been a great transition is the leadership of the office prior to me arriving from Steve Singer. Um, he has uh, done a wonderful job of kind of paving the way for me. He sends his regards. He's doing well. He's actually teaching senior English electives and enjoying his post-college counseling life as a Horace Mann faculty member today. So as the person who oversaw 25 years of college guidance at Horace Mann, his advice and support have been absolutely invaluable. And Steve really helped smooth the way for my arrival, allowing me to hit the ground running. So this is what we're going to do today. Uh, what I'd like to try and do is cover a few topics for you. We're going to give you a sense of how the college admissions landscape has changed in the last 20 years. We're going to describe the changes we've been making here at Horace Mann. We're going to try and offer you some practical college counseling advice that would be appropriate no matter where you live or what kind of school your son, daughter, niece, nephew, or grandchild is actually going to. And we've got some great resources for you. So just in case you don't have access to solid college counseling, we think that some of the things we share today will be really helpful to you. And then finally, we're going to leave some time for questions that you may have. 20 years ago, this office was actually described as the college placement office. And it was described that way because those working in college guidance at schools like Horace Mann could actually place a call to a particular college and effectively place students at that particular college. And that call might have gone something like this. Jane has everything you could want in an applicant, grades, board scores, a well-rounded extracurricular resume, and she comes from a wonderful family. She wants to come to your college, so you should definitely admit her. Now, that was a time when colleges could easily manage the number of applications they were receiving. The competition for spaces wasn't all that imposing, and colleges relied a little more on prep schools to let them know who should be admitted. Today, we actually run a college counseling office. The competition for spaces in freshman classes has increased exponentially at many of the top colleges and astronomically at some of the most highly selective schools. So today's landscape actually requires us to counsel students based on their wants, needs, strengths, and family circumstances. We don't actually make the admissions decisions here in our office, but we help students understand how and where they have the best chance of being admitted. Those of you who actually applied to college 20 years ago or more probably applied to an average of five to seven colleges. 
But because of the uncertainty of today's college admissions process, our students at Horace Mann actually apply to an average of 10 to 14 colleges today. The competition has also changed. 20 years ago, much of the competition for our students came from our very own students and those kids at other top prep schools. Today, our students are competing with the kid from the rural surrounding area of Manhattan, Kansas, or the kid who grew up in the projects of Dorchester, Massachusetts, the kid who grew up on a reservation near Albuquerque, New Mexico, and the kid who learned English as a second language while going to school in Shanghai, China. Colleges have also cast their admissions net much wider than ever before. 20 years ago, the colleges that were admitting 80% of their applicants are now admitting about 25% of their applicants. A college like Boston College might fit into that category. Those colleges who were admitting 20% of their applicants years ago, colleges like Yale, Stanford, and MIT, are now admitting less than 7% of their applicants. And the reality is, is that even though good information is more readily available, the process has actually gotten much more complicated than it used to be. So why is it so complicated? Some of the reasons uh, that it's gotten more complicated are that there are more high school graduates. And even though that number seems to be plateauing nationwide, there are still more highly qualified high school graduates than ever before. Often I've heard students say, but I go to Horace Mann one of the best schools in the country. That has to count for something. And the reality is that there are kids at Harvard Westlake in Los Angeles, Sidwell Friends in Washington, D.C., and the Woodlands, the public high school in Texas, who are saying the exact same thing, and rightfully so. There are lots of amazing high schools out there. And these high schools are providing better access to advanced level coursework for their students. Years ago, schools like Emory in Atlanta USC in Los Angeles, Washington University in St. Louis, and Vanderbilt in Nashville, Tennessee were much more regional in nature. They didn't have nearly the national reputation that they have today. And finally, we talked about this a little bit before, colleges are casting a wider admissions net. Over the years, they've developed strong institutional priorities. Development, legacy, and athletics have always been fairly important, but you can add socioeconomic diversity, international students, science, technology, engineering, and math programs, and geographic diversity to the list of institutional priorities today. The internet has made information about colleges much more available to everyone, including top students in other parts of the world. Colleges have also started traveling around the world in small groups to reach groups of students who might not know much about these different colleges here in the state. All of us is leading to uncertainty and predicting admissibility. And this is, the, this is the thing that kind of vexes us today as we try and counsel these kids through the process, is trying to predict admissibility so that kids can know where they have the best chance of being admitted. Ten years ago, we used a five-year GPA and SAT average to kind of help us figure out whether or not a student would be competitive at a particular school. Five years ago, we changed to a three-year average as things became a little bit more volatile in the college admissions world. And today, we actually go year to year. Every year, we take a look at the, the statistics so that we can better counsel the kids through the process. So why is it so difficult to predict? In the last five years, these three schools have experienced an incredible jump in college applications. Now, it's not a surprise that Princeton would receive or have a huge jump in, uh, in applications. But I think the thing that's, that's interesting about this list is that a school like Vanderbilt, which was very regional in nature several years ago, is now a big player on the national scene, and they have also seen a huge increase in applications, as has a school like Colgate, which is a smaller liberal arts college in the Northeast. Applications have skyrocketed in five years at all three of these schools. But the spaces in the incoming class have not changed. Princeton still has 1,300 kids in their incoming class, Vanderbilt and Colgate. Those incoming classes haven't changed at all. So more applications, same number of spaces, makes it very difficult for us to predict. The truth is, is that everybody has a story. And every time we run across a student who didn't get admitted to a particular school, they always have somebody that they think probably got in because or uh, got in before them. 
The reality is, is that no one really knows why they were admitted or perhaps why they were not admitted. They think they do, but it's hard for them because they're not in the committee room and they don't really know the conversation that was had about their particular application. Let's take a look at a college applicant from the late 80s. This is a person who was in the top 3% of his graduating class. He had reasonable SAT scores, a high school All-American swimmer and a college recruit, a legacy applicant, half African-American and half Vietnamese, adopted by a Swedish and Irish family, and from a small farming community near Fresno, California. Now, you would think, with that kind of background, this student probably had a pretty good shot at being admitted to all kinds of different schools. Well, I can tell you from experience, this kid actually applied to Harvard, and that's me on the far right. Now, my first question after I was denied was how in the world could this happen? I felt like I had done all the right things and had all kinds of things to help me through the process. A father who had gone to Harvard, he didn't give a lot of money, but he did go. I was being recruited as an athlete. It just seemed like this would be a good place for me to go and I'd have a very good shot. Now that I've worked in college admissions for about 20 years, I have a better sense of how this actually happened. Enrollment management is how colleges figure out how many students they can admit and then also which students they're going to admit. It's a process that goes something like this. At Harvard, they have about 1,600 spaces in the incoming class. They had about 4,200 students apply early action to Harvard, so applying by November 1 and deciding or finding out if they were admitted by middle of December. 4,200 students applied early action. Harvard admitted 772 of those students through early action. They predicted that 92% of those admitted students would actually attend, which means that they were predicting about 710 students would attend. If you subtract that, that uh, uh, 710 from 1,600, you get about 890 spaces left for regular decision. Harvard predicted through their modeling that about 80% of those students admitted for regular decision would attend, which when you do the quick math, comes out to about 1,100 admitted students for regular decision. That means they have 1,100 spots to give away for regular decision. When you are looking at 30,000 regular decision applications, you're now looking at an admit rate of about 3.5%. So this is how Harvard figures out how many students they can admit. They have 40 varsity sports, which a lot of people don't realize. They actually have one of the largest athletic programs in the country. You would think it would be a school like USC or the University of Florida, but Harvard has one of the largest athletic programs in the country. They have a $30 billion plus endowment and growing. That's a very important institutional priority for them. They have hundreds of years of legacy. There are lots of families who have some kind of family connection to Harvard. And they've got a lot of other institutional priorities, geographic and religious diversity, all kinds of other different things that they're paying attention to. So who is getting admitted these days? We hear a lot from families. If we're not privileged or we're not underprivileged, then what the heck are we and how are we going to make it through this process? How do we navigate this kind of landscape? How do we best prepare our students for the college admissions process? How do we manage the expectations of our students and their parents? We need a plan. And this is the plan that we've put together in the last couple of years to take Horace Mann forward for the next 50. The first is we really want to align academic advising and college counseling so that the advice that students are getting makes sense for both their academic life here at Horace Mann and for their goals uh, in college down the line. We want to give better information earlier in the process. While we don't actually meet with students individually until the middle of the junior year, we've begun a series of programs where we actually meet with families in larger groups in as early as the ninth grade. Naviance is something we're going to talk a little bit about down the line here in this presentation, but it's a program that helps our students research colleges and get a better sense as to whether or not they can be admitted to particular schools. We use scattergrams and something called the stats book, which I'll show you in a little bit, which helps students know whether or not they're going to be competitive at different colleges. We also introduced a new program called case studies, 
where we invite 25 admissions officers from some of the best schools around the country to lead our students and parents through a series of conversations about how students are admitted. Basically, our students and our parents actually get to serve as an admissions committee, go through an application, and make some decisions like a college admissions committee would do. We're also figuring out a way to provide standardized test prep. We know that lots of families pay for that on their own, and we'd like to find a way to offer some of that for families um, at cost or at no cost. We're talking about college tours a chance to get our students out on these different campuses that they might not see and have them have an experience uh, at what college looks like today for kids. Financial planning is something that all families need to pay attention to today as the costs for college continue to skyrocket. So we'll be sitting down with families and talking to them early about how to plan financially for a college future. We're also talking about gap year options. Anyone who's come to Horace Mann knows that it can be a grind at times and that there are many students who would benefit from maybe taking a year off before going to college. And then finally, we use Naviance as a way to actually submit documents. Those of you who were here years ago remember envelopes and stamps and writing addresses on envelopes and all that kind of stuff. We don't do that anymore. We do everything electronically, which streamlines the process and makes sure that all the documents arrive to colleges on time. As Con mentioned, we work most closely with juniors and seniors in the college pro counseling process here at Horst Mann, but we offer advice to students and families beginning in ninth grade so that they are on track and in a good position when we meet more fo formally. Some general things to keep in mind. We tell them to appropriately challenge yourself academically. Students should select the most challenging courses they can handle across the disciplines both rigor or the strength of a curriculum, and performance matter. The transcript really is the backbone of any college application. Required versus recommended courses. Think of this in terms of high school graduation, college admission, and completion. Required courses are really the minimum. Students should aim beyond that. Aim for what is recommended. Down the road, competitive applicants for selected schools have generally taken more than what's required. Why should you be thinking about this in the ninth grade? We don't want families to hear this for the first time from admissions officers when visiting campuses junior year. Many courses build on one another. Honors or AP courses may require prerequisite courses and so on. We don't want students to inadvertently limit college options later with decisions made now. Experiment with different extracurricular activities. Students can get involved at school, a place of worship, in the neighborhood, on the, so on the local, state, national level. They should try lots of new things. Find out what it is they like to do and how they want to spend their time outside of the classroom. Summer is for fun and enrichment. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. They should just enjoy. Grade 10, again, continue to appropriately challenge yourself academically. Identify what matters to you, to you, not to colleges, but to you. Students initially join several activities, then they should pause and reflect and identify which ones bring the most personal joy and reward. Yes, they may be thinking, are you moving toward the leadership role? When students identify those extracurricular activities that they most enjoy, they should stick with them. Stick with them for the long haul. Make the commitment and begin to think about how to distinguish themselves. Is it time to take the PSAT? Students, yes, typically take the preliminary SAT as sophomores or juniors. It's good practice for the SAT and provides feedback on where students' strengths and weaknesses lie. Junior year. Again, appropriately challenge yourself academically. Yes, there is a theme here. It bears repeating. Students should continue to challenge themselves across the discipline. Now, they may want to drop some courses for others or begin to specialize. Be cautious, talk with advisors, deans, and counselors. Sometimes it is appropriate, sometimes not. Students shouldn't shy away from a challenge, but should aim to finish junior year strong. Impact versus leadership. Not everyone can be class president or captain. There simply aren't enough titles or positions to go around. And students, frankly, don't necessarily need them to have impact in the community. Whether a student has a title or not, the questions we often ask are, what are the contributions you are making? How would people describe your impact? What will your legacy be? Testing and test prep, SAT or ACT, subject test or not, practice test or tutor, devise a plan based on a student's interests, strengths, and weaknesses, and potential college list. Researching you versus researching colleges. We discuss this a lot. 
The order of this is important. Self-assessment first. It's critical. Ask questions like, what challenges me, inspires me? What are my favorite subjects? Who do I admire? What kind of intellectual and social communities will I thrive in? Then research and visit colleges while keeping the answers in mind. Senior year, I'll say it again, appropriately challenge yourself academically. Grades during the first half of senior year are important. Aim to finish even stronger than junior year. Seems obvious, but so too are the final grades. Beware of senioritis. Colleges require final transcripts, can rescind offers, place students on academic probation. I served on many final transcript review committees when I was in admissions. We don't want them to be that student. Get organized. After much exploration, the college process is a task and deadline-driven one. Students and families need to find ways to stay organized throughout. Organization also makes for a happier senior who can truly relish in all the other important experiences senior year brings. Build a thoughtful and balanced list of colleges to apply to. More on this in a minute. Use Naviance. This is an online tool, as Khan suggested, both high schools and families use to navigate this process from the initial search to the actual application. And again, we'll talk about this in more depth later. Complete the common application. Nearly 500 colleges and universities use it, some along with institution-specific supplements. A recent change to the college essay, which we think is worth noting, the decision to drop the open-ended topic of your choice prompt and to add new questions like, describe a place or environment where you are perfectly content. Hmm. Naviance. Again, this is an online tool. Research you, research colleges, build a thoughtful and balanced list. Students are able to go in and look and think about personality types, learning styles, career interests. There are indeed search engines, schools where you can see overlap. They'll begin to think about colleges I'm thinking about. Um, when we build the thoughtful and balanced list, the colleges I'm thinking about will become the colleges I'm applying to. Again, we'll talk about more specifically how we do that and tailor it. A thoughtful list means taking into account a student's strengths, what he or she is good at and interests, what he or she enjoys. These aren't always the same things. But along with a student's wants versus needs, the needs are the must-haves, the non-negotiables. I'll only be happy at University X if. In our office, we use a preliminary worksheet and self-assessment slash college survey to gather this information and discuss in person. Students rank criteria on a scale from one to five. One very important to five very unimportant. Things like location, size, reputation, rigor, diversity, school spirit, making your parents happy, to name a few. Then they search and find colleges which comfortably match their criteria. A balanced list means including schools with a range of selectivity. There are realistic reaches, thinking about less than a 20% chance, and we do discuss realistic reaches because there are also what we describe as the reach. Um, so some students will decide maybe or maybe not to go for that UV long reach, but we're looking for realistic reaches. Target, about a 50-50% chance. The likely or probable. Gone are the days of saying safety school. When I applied to colleges many, many years ago, we talked about safety schools. We don't use that language anymore. We're thinking about a 7 to 90% chance of admission. We use a number of tools and surveys and questionnaires to help the kids build these thoughtful lists. To help them build balanced lists, we use two fantastic tools. The first is the Navion scattergram. So what you're looking at on the screen right now is basically a graph with intersection between standardized test score and GPA. What this does is it allows students to look at where they might plot themselves on an admissions graph for a particular college or university. This is built by putting in the statistics from previous Horace Mann classes. So we can go back as far as probably 10 years ago and produce a graph that would give a student an idea of how competitive they might be at a particular college or university. This is absolutely invaluable because it's one thing to be competitive at a particular school. It's another thing to be actually admitted through committee. The first question is, are you competitive? And the scattergram helps us answer that question. The second tool that we use uh, is actually something called the stats book. This is brand new to Horace Mann. We just started it last year. And it's a different kind of visual representation of statistics, admission statistics, at a particular college for Horace Mann kids. 
So what you're looking there at there on the screen is actually a list of applicants to George Washington University in Washington, D.C. This is one year of statistics, and it allows our student to go in, find themselves or where they would be in terms of GPA, and get an idea of the students in their particular GPA and test score range who were admitted to George Washington University or any other school that interests them. The bottom line with both of these tools is answering the question, will the student be competitive at that particular college? So what are colleges looking for? We're going to go through some of the things on the left so that you have an idea of how colleges view them. They are definitely looking for all those things. That person on the right, that's kind of old school. I'm not sure they're looking for that guy anymore, but we're going to walk you through some of the things on the left so you have a better idea of how to counsel your son or daughter. Courses and grades. The key indicators here are certainly the grades, but colleges are also looking at the courses you've taken to achieve those grades, as well as, and this is very important, courses you could have taken. And what this means is, is that colleges are taking a look to see if you have challenged yourself as best you could in your particular high school environment. If you're at a school where they limit the number of AP courses, then the college is going to know that and wouldn't expect that you have 10 AP courses on your transcript. If you're at a college that limits, based on advising, the number of honors courses you can take, again, then the college would not expect that you would have a ton of honors courses on your record. The last piece there on this particular slide is the trend in grades. And this is another thing that is very, very important. Colleges are looking to see that you're continually improving. You can be consistently a B student every single year of high school, or you can be a student that maybe started out a little lower than that but has continued to improve and is now achieving mostly A's and B's. But your trend in grades definitely counts. Now, I had to include this slide because it just seems at a place like Horace Mann, where we have a lot of great testers, testing becomes a huge thing. And I think kids put a ton of emphasis on it. And on some level, it makes sense, because it's one of the things in the application that you can actually quantify. You can quantify test scores. You can't really quantify how nice a person is. But you can definitely quantify test scores, which is part of the reason our students probably fixate on testing a little too much. Some things to think about. ACT or the SAT, it's really up to you. It doesn't really make any difference to the colleges. It is true that the ACT or the SAT might be more popular in a particular part of the country, but ultimately, when it comes to how colleges view them, it's really up to your comfort level and what makes sense for you. The only way to know if the ACT or the SAT is the right thing for you is to actually go to a company that provides test prep and take a test under testing conditions. It's the only way to know for sure. It is true that the ACT is a little faster paced, but that doesn't mean that students going, a student who knows the material front and back or forwards and backwards will really be able to do well on that test. You really have to go into a test prep company and take a practice test to know for sure. The other thing to remember is there's nothing unique about your test score. I can find thousands of kids around the country who have the same exact scores as you do. So fixating on something that doesn't really make you unique probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. For most students, two or three times is sufficient. This is not an extracurricular activity. And believe me, a place like Horace Mann, we have a lot of students who would love to take that test over and over and over and over again. It just doesn't make much sense. The other thing to know is that there are colleges out there where test scores are actually optional. You don't have to submit standardized test scores. And for a student who's not a great tester, maybe that's a good option. Standardized test prep is something that has really grown over the last 10 years. 20 years ago when I took the test, I didn't do any prep at all. I walked in on a Saturday morning, sort of awake, and actually took the test. Today, families will spend more time and resources on preparing students for these exams. And there's nothing wrong with that but you do need to be smart about how you do it. Ultimately, there are two things that happen with test prep. One is strategy, learning how the process of elimination works to come up with a particular answer, or how the test is scored, or the timing of a particular test. And then there's the content. And the content is really how much you know about different topics. Sometimes some of the best preparation is actually just going to school. 
reading a lot would help a student a lot on the critical reading portion of the exam. So you don't always have to spend a lot of money to get good test prep. If you're really paying attention to content and doing well in school, you are preparing for the test. Extracurricular activities. And I have to tell you, we're often amused by the strategy employed by kids hoping to build an extracurricular resume. They seem to believe that particular activities are going to net particular results in the college admissions process, but nothing could be further from the truth. What we tell students is, do what's fun and interesting. It's not really what you do, it's why you do it. Ultimately, when you have to explain why you chose to play the trumpet, or why you chose to play soccer, or why you've decided to be an actor, those are the things that are really interesting to the college admissions officers. They're not necessarily interested in what you do, more about why you decided to do it. And if your answer is, I did it because my mom told me to, stance that answer, it's just not a very good one or a very interesting one. But if you say, I do that particular sport, or I play that particular sport because my dad played it and it's the one thing we can talk about without arguing, that's actually an interesting answer. The last thing we say about extracurriculars, enjoy your summers. Extracurricular activities exist in the summer and that's a good time to try some things that you've never tried before. We get this question a lot too. Should I be well-rounded or well lopsided? The truth is, is that years ago, colleges were looking for lots of really, really well-rounded kids. But what they discovered is when you get a bunch of those kids on campus, it's actually kind of boring. So they realized that they could build a well-rounded class of students by finding some students who were actually really well lopsided, angular, someone who had found a particular activity and really excelled at a high level. That's okay. There's room for both of these kinds of students on college campuses today personal statements, and it says it, it says everything at the very bottom of this, the bane of every college applicant, the admissions essay. Questions have gotten more abstract, strange, funny, weird. We've heard all kinds of adjectives to describe some of the different questions out there. There's a college in the Midwest that actually asked this year, where's Waldo? I, I don't even know how to start to answer that, but it's something that our kids have to wrestle with when they sit down to write personal statements. Here are some things to remember. Essays actually provide the student's voice. It's supposed to sound like a teenager. It's not supposed to sound like a 25-year-old, a 35-year-old, or a grandparent. It's not. It's supposed to sound like a 17-year-old. They add context to an application. These kids are pretty two-dimensional in the application until you get to the essays, and you really start to understand what makes some of these kids tick and why they're so motivated to be the great kids they really are. Last thing, essays are read by regular people. It's not like these are specialists in college essay writing that are reading these things. They're regular people like you and me who are very interested in kids and kids having a chance to do what they love to do in college. That's it, they're regular people. Here's some advice about things to write about and maybe things not to write about. We get a lot of essays from students who scored the winning goal in a soccer match or who want to describe their parents' divorce, or their fantastic sleepaway camp that they go to every summer. Those are fine topics, but they're not that unique, and a lot of kids write about them. And when you're 17 and you've had a similar experience as everyone else, you're probably going to write a very similar essay. So we tell students we need to think a little bit about some other topics. In your own voice, find something that makes you really happy, really sad, or really angry something that really elicits a strong emotion in you because it's probably a very personal thing. When we get emotional about something, it's because we care about it. And so that's probably something you should write about. The other piece is why versus what. Again, what can be interesting and is important, but it's not as interesting as the why. Why something made you really happy or really sad or really angry. That's the most important thing. All right, so how do we pay for all this? I don't know if you can see the cartoon on the screen right now, but it's actually a trick-or-treater at the door, and the caption is, I agree, it's not much of a costume, but apparently it scares the heck out of my parents. And the trick-or-treater is actually wearing a t-shirt that says college tuition cost. I don't care how much money you make, the college tuition costs are very scary, and they continue to go up every year. So what we wanted to do is give you some financial aid web resources 
so that if you're curious about this and want to start looking into it, you can do it. First thing is the net price calculator. This is actually a, a calculator that estimates your net price for attending a particular college. The website is there on the screen, and so if you decide later on you want to come back, highlight that and go in and take a look at the calculator. It's a very, very interesting piece of information. Second thing is the FAFSA form. This is a free application for federal student aid, and it's something that all students who apply for financial aid must fill out. Most students who apply for financial aid are probably going to have to fill out the CSS profile. This is through the College Board, the College Scholarship Service. So you can take a look at that website as well. The last bullet point there is for something called a scholarship search engine. We have a lot of families that ask us about public and private scholarships. If you search or Google for U.S. News scholarship search engine, it will come up and it will actually give you five different search engines that are free which will help your child locate some scholarships they might qualify for. In conceptualizing this webinar, uh, Khan and I were quite certain that we needed to provide some practical advice for our alumni parents near and far, some real takeaways. Parents have an important role in the college process beyond the Financial Aid 101 paying the bill, um, but the clearer parents are on what that role entails, we find the smoother the process is for everyone. One of the classic lines we often repeat is one of the simplest and most salient pieces of advice we can offer today. Please don't be more memorable than your child. Allow your son or daughter to take center stage, to shine. Listen, guide, and support. Resist the temptation to take too much control or ownership of what is their process. Beware of the helicopter parent. Again, I don't know if you can see the cartoon, but aptly named, they hover. They pay too close attention to their child's experience, ask too many questions, make too many calls, and offer too many complaints. College administrators began using this term wildly in the early 2000s when I entered admissions. As a former admissions officer, I know all too well the exasperation evidenced in this cartoon. I'm having a bit of a flashback here to the end of info sessions, college nights, and college fairs. Listen to us. Don't be that parent. So what else not to do? Don't do the work for them. Don't check in for them on campus visits or ask all the questions on the tour or write their essays or fill out their applications or call the admissions office for decisions. Yes, I've seen it all. Don't relive your college process through them, for better or for worse. You've been there, done that, it's their turn. Your alma mater might not be their dream school. A school you don't like may be in fact the one they fall absolutely in love with. Go figure. Don't believe everything you read and hear. We stress this time and time again with students. It's applicable to parents too. There is still, unfortunately, misinformation out there, myths that persist. Be wary of the chatter, the gossip, sites like College Confidential. Don't panic. The uncertainty and unpredictability that Khan spoke of can sometimes, it can, it can get the best of us in some moments, but don't let it consume you or your child. Don't let the anxiety or fear steer this process. So let hope and possibility prevail. What do you do? Do encourage your child to take responsibility for planning and applying. The more they're able to navigate now, the better equipped they will be to choose the right school and thrive on campus. Do keep open lines of communication with your child and his or her counselor. Check in, be a sounding board, share insights about your child with his or her counselor. We use a parent questionnaire and meet to gather this information. Remember, we're all players on the same team with the same goal, finding schools that are a great match for your child. Do you identify the people, resources, and programs you need to stay informed and support your child? Read, we have some great suggestions coming up. Attend parent and family meetings with his or her counselor. Attend programs hosted by the school's college counseling office, or maybe your alma mater. Points for being here with us today. Still here, Bueller, Bueller. Anyone? Anyone? Yes, I'm dating myself, jokes aside. Do have faith in your child and in the process. Trust that you've raised your child to successfully navigate this process, but more importantly, to succeed in college and in life. Be there to soften the blow of the deny, to celebrate the admit, say I love you often, remind them. It's not about the number of schools that they did or didn't get into. It's about the excitement for that one school that they will call home. So remember, you're not the first or the last parent to go through this process. We suggest some good reads. These are by no means exhaustive, merely a snapshot of the books and websites to consider. 
I'm going to college, not you. Surviving the college search with your child is a thoughtful collection of essays for parents by parents. Letting Go, a parent's guide to understanding the college years, discusses the physical and emotional processes of letting go, and introduces the challenges and services available at colleges and universities. There are web resources. We continually update the Horseman College Counseling website with our handbook, school profile, testing information, and college attendance statistics. The New York Times is the choice, demystifying college admission and aid features relevant and current information, including high school seniors from around the world blogging about their college search, articles from admissions and counseling professionals, calendars, checklists, and so on. The College Board website is more than just standardized test information. Check out Big Future. It's a site dedicated to students and parents to help them find colleges, explore careers, apply to and pay for college. There are searches, quizzes, great short video clips, and more. College guidebooks. Some of you will prefer the old school guidebooks to flip through. I still love a good book. We use them here in the office. Check out Colleges That Change Lives. This is a book that helps families look beyond the Ivy League into 40 schools who, that you may never have heard of. Fisk is a more classic, a comprehensive and systematic guidebook, including more than 300 institutions with statistics and descriptive essays filled with student perspectives. Book references. If you are still curious after this webcast and want to delve even deeper into the college admissions process, if you're looking for the practical and also the philosophical, then you should consider these books. The Chosen, The Hidden History of Admission and Exclusion at Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. This is a sociologist's look at admissions policies and practices at these schools and the current debates in the field. College Unranked, Ending the College Admissions Frenzy. Please, please, let's end the college admissions frenzy. This is a collection of essays in which professionals in the field, the writers, they grapple with and remind us, what's it all for? Less about trophies or tickets to success, more a matter of fit, new knowledge, and growth. The Gatekeepers, Inside the Admissions Process of a Premier College. This is a New York Times reporter who kind of entered, observed, tells a behind-the-scenes tale of the admissions process over the course of a year at Wesleyan University in 1999. So with that, happy reading. I love this quote, absolutely love it. And I love it because this is essentially what we're trying to do to help our students. We provide them the tools to help them navigate this process efficiently. Then we show them how to use those tools to make wise decisions about colleges, which would be good fits for them, and colleges where they have a good chance of being admitted. We got some final thoughts for you. You can't present yourself well unless you know yourself well. So kids should take plenty of time to reflect. When I was a teenager, I had a lot more time where I could sit and reflect and think about who I was and what I wanted to do. Today's kids are plugged in all the time, and they don't have as much time or don't seem to have as much time to sit and actually reflect about who they are and what they want in life. We need to help them find that time. Summertime is a great time for that. But the dinner table is also a great time for that. And having conversations about what the kids want and what they think they want for their future are really, really helpful for our kids. Whether it's an SAT score, GPA, or college decision, don't let this process define you. It's rare that your SAT score will be the topic of conversation when you get to college. Every now and then it might be, but it's rare. It really only matters for a very short period of time. And as I said before, there's nothing unique about that GPA or that SAT score. It's really difficult when kids allow these things to define who they are. They're much bigger, much better than any of those things. Be authentic. The more you strategize, the tougher it is to stand out in the crowd. And that is definitely true. We see that a ton. If you actually pull Ten seniors into a room and ask themselves or ask them to come up with a strategy for getting into college they would come up with the same strategy so they just erase all of their uniqueness so if kids are being authentic aggressively pursuing their true authentic interests they are more likely to stand out in the crowd of really really highly qualified candidates and in the end you'll be much more interesting if you did things in which you had a genuine interest that's always been true, but it's especially important as the colleges have made it a little bit more complicated and a little bit tougher to get in. So if kids are doing things where they have a genuine interest, they're more likely to talk about it in an interesting way, in an essay, or in an interview that they may do for colleges. 
We've actually tried to cover quite a bit of ground today, and I want to thank you all for tuning in. Hopefully, we've done it in a way that makes sense and provides you with some good perspective. At this point, we'd like to answer as many questions as we can in the time we have left. And it looks like we have about 15 minutes, so we're going to take a look at a couple of questions and see if we can answer them for you. Thank you, Tony and Khan. Why don't we move to the first question? Again, we have approximately 15 minutes left in this webinar. Our first question, how useful is the U.S. news and World Report ranking? Are these ratings truly reflective of the caliber of the school academically or just based on endowment and good PR on the part of the university or college? Connor, Tony, who wants to take this one? Give that one a shot, and then if Tony has something to say, she can jump in. Ultimately, the U.S. News and World Report rankings are PR, really nothing more than that. The reality is, is when I was at the University of Pennsylvania and we had to sit and someone had to fill out the survey for U.S. News and World Report, they were not someone that necessarily knew about a lot of other schools. So a good example is academic reputation is part of that survey. Well, the secretary or the assistant or this person who is sitting there and filling out that survey may not know a lot about some other colleges. That's not necessarily a good way to measure academic reputation, somebody's opinion in some admissions office somewhere who may or may not know about some of these other schools. I don't think it's a good way of determining quality. It doesn't say anything about student satisfaction, what the classroom experience was like for that particular kid, how they were supported in their search for a job. There are lots of different factors that should go into a college decision that have nothing to do with the criteria that's used in U.S. News and World Report. I understand why families look at it and why kids look at it, but if you really broke it down and looked at the criteria, you would be surprised at what is used in those rankings. Thanks, Con. Why don't we field the second question? When in their high school careers do HM students start work with Navia? I'll take that one. Uh, that is in the junior year, uh, spring of junior year, actually meeting with students right now. We've been having them fill out the forms and having student meetings, and we've given them passwords, so they're logging in, they're exploring colleges, they're making comparisons, identifying the colleges that they're thinking about, so they begin in the spring of their junior year. Thanks, Tony. Moving right along, how important is GPA? Are kids somewhat disadvantaged if their GPA is average at intensely competitive schools like HM? I'll take that one. And one of the great things about being here at Horseman is that we do a really, really good job of framing a student's academic experience. What I mean is we do a good job of explaining why a student took the particular courses they took, what the advising structure is that, that got that kid to land in those particular courses, and how their GPA, or how they earned that particular GPA. I, I understand when families are worried about how intense it can be at a school like Horace Mann, but the reality is, is that it doesn't seem to affect the kids in the college process. If it did, we would see much, much different results. Um, but I think the colleges give our kids the benefit of the doubt. If there's ever a question, they know that a kid from Horace Mann has actually put in the work, has built and, and um, uh, improved on their study skills to a point where they're not going to have trouble in college. So our kids get the benefit of the doubt, no question about it. Thank you. Next up, what are some of your favorite schools that families don't often know about? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I think we're seeing more and more schools come on the national scene. I mentioned a few of them earlier, like an Emory or um, uh, a Vanderbilt. Um, a Duke, a Rice in Houston, Texas, um, Carnegie Mellon, Georgia Tech. We're seeing a lot of schools that are doing much more national recruitment um, that we think are really great fits for a lot of our kids. Uh, Case Western is another school that has really started to pop up quite a bit. The University of Chicago, which here at Horace Mann at least had not been um, super popular years ago, is really starting to come on. The other thing we're seeing is, is that kids have to think a little bit about why they were successful here at Horace Mann. They were in classes that were a little smaller. They were in classes where they could actually build relationships with their peers and with their teachers. And we want them to think a little bit about that for the college level as well, that there are some fantastic smaller liberal arts schools 
that will provide a larger environment than Horace Mann, but one that is equally as nurturing and centered around community. So it's one of the reasons why a school like Colgate has become really popular over the last few years. It's another reason why a school like Hamilton has become really popular, or Elon University in North Carolina, or Davidson in North Carolina. There are lots of schools out there that are a little bit smaller that provide an environment that's a lot more like Horace Mann than some of the other larger schools out there. What would you tell a student who's thinking about studying abroad? In high school and or in college. For college. For college. Go. Yes. <laughs> I would. I would encourage that. Um, absolutely. I feel like there are many students who do, in fact, choose to study abroad. It's an option at many, many colleges. Um, I think it is an experience. We live in an increasingly global world. Um, there are often opportunities for you to get credit or not to have financial aid monies travel with you. So I say yes, yes. It's funny that I took this question because it's one of the things I wasn't able to do when I was in college. There was a Gulf War. Again, I won't, I'm sort of dating myself, but all the programs were canceled. Um, and that's the one thing I look back on with regret. So yes, to study abroad. For the Ivies and for a legacy applicant, is it bad for a rising senior to spend a summer in a lab at, say, Columbia, hence specializing early rather than having uh, fun or heading to Rwanda for the summer? We have seen kids be admitted to different Ivy League institutions having done either of those kinds of things. So it really comes down to what the student wants to do and how he or she will explain that, that decision. That's the most important thing. There are reasons why either of those things would be really good. Uh, so it's impossible to really say there's only one answer here. Uh, because I think both are actually great experiences depending on what the kid wants to do. As long as they have a good explanation, either is fine. How popular is the gap year among current HM students? We're seeing more and more kids talk about it. Talk and actually doing it are two different things. There are two ways that kids actually arrive at a gap year. One is, is that some colleges have said to a student, we will admit you, but we're going to admit you for next year's class. We would really like you to take a gap year. And it doesn't have anything to do really with a student's ability to do well in college. It's more an enrollment management tool for colleges. And because they want the kids to arrive on campus refreshed and ready to go to get the most out of their college experience. The second way a kid arrives at the gap year program is because they've thought about it in advance of their senior year. They've talked to their parents a little bit about what they could do in a gap year, what, actual, what an actual gap year means. Um, Last year, I believe we finally hit double digits for the number of kids who either took a gap year or were very, very close, had actually planned it out and were really going to do that, and then for some reason or another decided not to take it. So we're seeing more and more kids do it, and we are planning to get more involved in that. Presenting that as an option earlier on in the high school process, uh, I think we'll probably see more kids do it. And after you've been a student here for a long period of time, the idea of a gap year might really be a good one, um, especially if you're a parent wondering about the return on your college investment. Um, you've got a kid who arrives on a college campus excited, refreshed, and ready to go. Let's shift gears a bit. What is the value of the SAT score? Is a 2200 the same as a 2400? Value of an SAT score. Again, interesting, when I was in admission, students would ask about this, and I would often say that the SAT score was more important than I was willing or wanted to admit, based on my own educational philosophy, um, but probably less so than they thought, back to kind of what Khan was saying about this anxiety about testing and retesting and it not being an extracurricular activity. So it is one measure, it is one part of the process, but along with your transcripts and letters of recommendation and extracurriculars and all of those things. The 2200 versus the 2400, I think I would suggest for students and, pam students and families to look at their potential colleges, look at the range. Am I in the middle 50%? Am I above or below to kind of gauge? That's a really difficult question to answer just at face value. Um, but again, you are, it is important, but you are more than your test score. How should the family of a recruited athlete proceed? It's an interesting one because I think we're seeing more and more students with that kind of athletic ability here at Horace Mann, which is a good thing because overall it helps us in the college process, I think, a little bit. 
Um, one of the warnings I would give families who have a student who might actually be able to play in college is that while it's an advantage, if athletics is an institutional priority at a particular college, it also means that there are more cooks in the kitchen. And what I mean is, is that now we've got a coach at that particular college who also needs to weigh in. So even if a student is academically competitive at a particular school, that coach is speaking to that student athlete and a lot of other student athletes. So there's no guarantee that that coach is really going to be able to put 100% of his or her support behind that particular applicant. So you have to proceed with caution. And this is one of those things where you really want to make sure that you're staying close to the college counselors so that when a coach tells your student, I think I can support you in the college admissions office, the college counselor at your high school can actually go to the admissions office at that school and ask if that coach is indeed supporting that particular student athlete. So it's an advantage, but you really have to be smart about it, and that means open lines of communication between the student athlete and the college counselor. We hear lots of stories about students at the top tier private schools applying to 10, 12, 15, 20 colleges. For a Horace Mann student, what do the two of you believe the correct number of colleges to pursue in round one truly is? And how would you break it down for any student, given their individual academic profile? Well, I will tell you a couple of things. First of all, we actually limit the number of applications that a student can file, and that is 14. And the reason we do that is because we need to make sure that kids are being very thoughtful about the college list that they put together. If a kid applies to eight Ivies, all right, they're going to get those decisions all on the same day. And I don't care how great your self-esteem is, if you get rejected at more than two, more than three, more than four, five, or six of them, it does not feel good. That's one of the reasons we limit it. If we, if we didn't have a limit, kids would apply to all kinds of schools where they didn't have a realistic shot at being admitted. And that's what we're trying to avoid. We don't want kids walking around with all of this bad news hanging over their head. So if we limit the number of applications, they are forced to be very thoughtful and to have a very balanced list. Schools that are considered reaches for them, schools that are considered targets, and schools that are considered more likely. So we usually see anywhere between 10 to 14. Now the other piece of this is the early round. And we have, over the last several years, seen that number grow quite a bit. It used to be, I think probably 10 years ago, that you would see maybe 50 or 60% of the kids actually applying early. This year, we actually had closer to 90%. So what that's forced us to do is really make sure that our kids are well prepared just in case applying early to a particular college makes sense. There are very few places where you can strategize in the college process, but applying early or regular or to particular schools is one of those places you can strategize a little bit. But I wouldn't strategize without the help of your college counselor because your college counselor is the only one who has seen all of the different pieces of the application. The letters of recommendation that the teachers will write, the transcript, the test scores, the letter of recommendation that the counselor writes. We're the only people who have seen all those pieces, so we're in the best position to actually help a student strategize. We don't want kids trying to strategize on their own. It just doesn't work, and the landscape is littered with kids who try to do that. I think we have time for one more. Why don't we find a quick question? When should a student start visiting colleges? And what are your thoughts about how an individual student should approach a college visit? We're generally recommending that students are visiting in their junior year, although we know some do the summer prior and so on. But I guess it's important, as we explained before, to really do that self-assessment piece first, to have an idea of who you are and what you're looking for and what matters. And then I think you're going to have a better experience when you're on college campuses. 
and how you do that. Uh, we've done a lot of that work in our evening programs and thinking about the visit, information sessions, campus tours, eat in the dining hall, grab a newspaper, take lots of notes and record your impressions. Again, as an admissions officer, I'd read a lot of why this school or that school, and it might have been a feeling, and I've always wanted this and dreamt about it since I was young. Um, but you really want to be able to eventually articulate your interest in that place and why you think it's a good fit and a place that you're going to thrive. Terrific. Tony and Khan, we have one more question. I think it's an important one, so if you don't mind, I'm going to toss it on the table. What are your thoughts, RE, private, counsel, private college counselor advisor? What do you think about that? Well, I understand why families think they might be helpful. When you're talking about this kind of an investment, you're talking about a child's dream to go to a particular school or, or kind of school, you want to put everything on the table. You want to make sure that you've given that child the best opportunity. I can understand going to get a second opinion, but here's the rub. When you go outside to find someone to give you that you're paying for college advice, there is a huge risk involved because you're paying for advice from someone who has not seen all of the pieces of the application, does not know who else is applying to a particular school from Horace Mann, does not know what teachers said or wrote about that particular student in a letter of recommendation, does not know the admission statistics from Horace Mann to that particular school. So you're paying for advice from someone who's kind of flying blind and really doesn't have all of the information at their disposal. The pieces of the application work together like puzzle pieces. And when you have someone on the outside giving you advice about one of those puzzle pieces, suddenly it just doesn't fit. And we see this every single year, that kids have trouble in the process because advice they got outside of Horace Mann just was, was incongruent with the advice that they were getting at Horace Mann. The college counselors here are the only ones who really have access to all that information, so they're in the best position to give the advice. Thank you. Well, that concludes today's webcast. We hope you pay attention to the website. You have an opportunity. We hope to have one more later on in the future before the end of the school year. And we will post today's webcast on both the alumni and the news portion of our website for further review and reference in the future. Please, as an alum, if you have a question or concern and you're not in the state of New York, but college and concerns about college are looming large, if we have the time, if we have the energy, if we have the resources, we're always happy to answer a question from an alum. So Khan's readily available, our team's happy to weigh in, and we wish you the best of luck with the process as it unpacks itself for you and yours. Thank you very much.